I'm Richard Jackson, and I'm a professor of peace studies here at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Um, I used to be professor of international politics uh, at Aberystwyth University in the United Kingdom. And before that, I worked at the University of Manchester in, in the United Kingdom. Um, but I've been here for, for more than a decade now. Um, one of the things that I do is I'm the editor in chief of the journal Critical Studies on Terrorism which is one of the, I would say, top three journals in terrorism studies um, that currently exists. Now, the journal um, is a little bit different from other journals uh, that look at security studies and terrorism studies because it takes an explicitly critical approach. That's why we call it the uh, critical studies on terrorism. Uh, and we mostly publish articles that adopt what we call the critical terrorism studies approach. Um, so this is a kind of an approach that's informed in some parts by what we call critical theory, but also more broadly, it's, it, it refers to efforts to try and challenge and critique um, and explore aspects of terrorism that are often taken for granted. Uh, so the journal publishes articles that have anything to do with terrorism, counterterrorism, the war on terror, uh, and aspects of, of the, the topic that are not often covered, such as state terrorism. Uh, or the other journals on terrorism um, publish almost no articles on state terrorism, whereas we've made a, a conscious decision that we want to try and encourage uh, people to do research and, and publish on state terrorism. Um, but we also look at a broader set of issues beyond sort of core security issues to look at things like the cultural representation of terrorism and how that shapes our, our understanding of it. Um, so yeah, quite a few articles that we've published in recent years have focused on uh, critical analysis of how terrorism is represented in different novels and films and television shows, but also critical analysis of how, for example, female terrorists are presented in the media um, uh, and so on. And our, our critical approach extends to um, taking a very strong ethical normative stance against things like Islamophobia, uh, which has been a characteristic of the war on terror. Um, and we've been very critical of things like uh, countering violent extremism or preventing violent extremism programs, which try and um, manipulate the way people think. Um, yeah, so the journal, you know, covers a wide array of different things, but it's always characterized by a kind of critical uh, approach. And this kind of leads me, I guess, into um, one of the common mistakes that uh, that people who submit to our journal sometimes make, and that is that they are not aware of the kind of theoretical background and the theoretical approach and the critical normative orientation uh, of our um, of our journal. <clears throat> so, they might do something that's much more conventional uh, security studies analysis, something that's designed to, <clears throat> for example, help governments fight terrorism better uh, and arrest more people and so on. Whereas our journal is much more interested in sort of trying to understand, well, who, who are the victims of counterterrorism and how might the harms caused by counterterrorism be mitigated? or how might we better understand what states are doing? So I think the first kind of rule of thumb is to always make sure that you read a sample of articles from a particular journal to get a flavor for the type of um, approach that they take, the, the, the kind of main scholars and main theoretical frameworks that they cite uh, and that they use in their research. Um, to make sure that your article, you know, really does fit that art, that journal, because quite often we reject articles, not because they're badly written or they're bad research, but simply because we don't think that they fit within our journal and our readers wouldn't be interested in uh, those kinds of articles. And so we, we usually recommend they go to a different journal uh, where they would be more accepted.
So another common mistake that's often made is um, when authors don't really follow the instructions that are laid out for them by the journal on the journal web page. So on the journal web page, any journal you, you submit to these days, there is always uh, a list of instructions. Uh, and these include how you're meant to upload your article, but also things like the, the article length. Um, a number of articles that, that we deal with are often either, you know, really short of what we would normally publish, or more often, way over in terms of their word length. It's usually a good idea to write an article that's a little bit shorter than the stated word length of, it, of the journal, uh, so that when you inevitably get some suggestions for revisions, you've got room to expand a little bit. Uh, because what's hard is if you've published an article that's, say, 12,000 words, which is the limit for our journal, which is a very generous limit uh, compared to most journals, uh, you publish an article that's 12,100 words, and then you get revisions that you have to expand upon, then suddenly you're way over, and then you've got to go back and, and trim off 2,000 words, um, and that's that can be hard. So Try to, try to follow that. Try to also follow uh, instructions about the presentation of the article. So if the, if the style of the journal says all the referencing has to be in text um, in a kind of like Harvard style, uh, don't send an article that's all footnoted um, because you know, you're gonna have to change that anyway and it will immediately you know, throw up a... Um, a warning sign that this person hasn't really looked at the journal. They don't really, uh, you know, appreciate the um, style that it's meant to be in, and they're not tailoring tailoring their article to fit that journal. In fact, what I always recommend is that you uh, print off or or download uh, a published copy of a journal article, and then try to make your article look exactly like that uh, in terms of the heading style you know, the <clears throat> abstract and the keywords and um, the spacings and everything, right? Just try and make it look as close as you can to that. And that will immediately um, help smooth the way for your article. Because I should have said, uh, particularly in our journal, but uh, in most journals, the, the process will be that you will upload your article and then it'll be read by usually one editor at least, but in our case, we have two editors who read the article uh, to decide whether it reaches the standard to be sent out to reviewers, because we don't want to send out articles to reviewers that we know are going to be rejected, that are going to waste their time because they don't reach uh, a kind of minimum standard. So the first obstacle when you're submitting an article is to get past the desk editor to make sure that they are going to um, take your article seriously, uh, think that it's of a sufficient standard to be able to be sent out for peer, proper peer review. So um, yeah, and, and the, one of the ways to do that is to make sure you've followed all the journal instructions, you've kind of tailored your article to that journal, um, and that it looks good. So yeah, that those, those are a few um, uh, common mistakes that are often um, a problem when, when, when we look at articles. Uh, another big mistake that happens, and, and you know, this, this is often the case for scholars from the global south, uh, uh, and particularly scholars who don't have English as their first language, is that the article is poorly written uh, in, in terms of, of English and expression. Now, in most Western journals, uh, that is often uh, a reason, first of all, for a desk reject, you know, just we're not even going to bother with this. Now, we recognize at Critical Studies on Terrorism that um, that shouldn't be a reason to desk reject, and we're often willing to try and work with um, Global South scholars um, because we feel that you know that's sometimes an obstacle that prevents Global South scholars from getting a fair hearing. Uh, and we wanna try and increase access. So we will often, of, often work with scholars on that and we won't use that 
that um, poor English as an excuse to desk reject, particularly if the article itself is, is solid and robust. But what you can do to, to help yourself is to, to really uh, make sure that your article is, is well written and expressed in English. And if that involves partnering with uh, a good English speaker um, or working in a sort of group to try and help each other improve your English, uh, or even paying a professional copy editor to help you write, uh, that is really worth doing because that, again, that will help you get over um, one of the first obstacles to um, getting your article published. And then I guess the, the, the last um, main reason why, why people get rejected and the, the mistakes, you know, it's a common mistake, and that is simply not having a rigorous, rigorous enough study. So if your study is overly descriptive and all it does is um, talk about existing secondary literature, it doesn't involve any collection of new data or it doesn't involve any new kind of theoretical uh, formulation that, that synthesizes what, what's already in the field in some kind of new way. Um, if it's just kind of descriptive, um, sometimes we'll reject articles as being not rigorous enough. It's always important to try and make sure that you follow really good research procedures, that you, um, you know, you review the literature that exists on a particular topic appropriately, that you identify a gap, uh, that you formulate a really concise um, research question, that then you adopt the appropriate methodology to answer that question, um, and that you then try and collect data and analyze that data in a rigorous way, uh, in a way that could be replicated by other scholars, for example, so that you're producing a rigorous kind of study. I mean, yeah, quite often um, one of the main criticisms of, um, of articles that we receive is that they don't follow these kind of procedures, and, and sometimes the article has very little that's written about the methodology that's that's been adopted and perhaps he isn't aware of the different um, dangers and disadvantages of using particular methodologies uh, and quite often we see the reviewers will say you know this article could be quite good but we don't really understand the methodology uh, and um, the methodological choices don't seem you know um, logical uh, and you you haven't thought about this or you haven't thought about that so you need to go away and 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 revise the methodology now all of these you know challenges are sometimes heightened for global south scholars who might not have access to um, the resources uh, sometimes they they don't have access to the, the libraries and the journals and the uh, the books and articles that um, scholars in, in the global north have. Um, so it's hard for them to review all the literature. Um, I mean, there's no easy answer to this, but, you know, I would think that one thing to do is to try and build networks and, and um, collaborations and partnerships with global north scholars uh, and get them to send you PDFs and send you um, uh, articles and things that you might come across that you need, which you can't access. Um, there are also, um, you know, scholars and sites out there that try to increase access to, to Global South scholars by, you know, offering free um, subscriptions to different um, resources. I mean, yeah, you've got, you've got to try and overcome some of these obstacles that face particularly Global South scholars because, um, Global South scholars are often kind of locked out a little bit from, from Western publishers, uh, Western-based journals. So yeah, my advice, try and try and find partnerships. I mean, one, one way to think about this is in a positive sense that um, scholars in the Global South have access to um, information and data and experiences and, and contexts that Global North scholars just don't. So this is a potentially rich source of, of analysis and a rich source of research. Um, and if you can form good collaborations, good partnerships with scholars in the global north, 
then you know you can be the eyes and ears on the ground collecting data and doing analysis uh, while then working together with someone from the global north who has access to all the libraries and can look at all the, the literature and help write a very, really good collaborative article. Um, so I think we need more of these kind of partnerships. Um, so I, I know it's not easy and it's, uh, yeah, everyone's uh, pressed for time, but um, it's worth investing in, in these kinds of partnerships. I think it's also important to, um, as I've said, try and always target the journal or the edited book or whatever uh, in a very precise way that, that takes account of what those um, that, that those journals or those those edited books are really looking for. So don't send things that are only marginally connected, uh, but try and tailor your research, try to tailor your article um, to the concerns of the journal, to the, the approaches that that journal uh, uses, to the kinds of questions that uh, that journal asks. Um, uh, that that's probably one of the most important things. And as I've said, yeah, just be a stickler for following the instructions and, and presenting your article in a really good way. So I guess, you know, on the top of off the top of my head, the, these are some of the key things that um, I would always advise people who want to submit to our journal. What we're looking for in the journal are, are original contributions. And, and what we mean by this, is uh, something that hasn't really been adequately covered before. Some, some kind of question uh, or some kind of puzzle or some kind of knowledge about, it might be something about a, a situation that is only just occurring, um, but it hasn't really been properly analyzed from an academic perspective before. So an original contribution might be, uh, first of all, empirical, in the sense that there, there might, for example, be studies on, let's say, studies on a particular political party in Iraq uh, that took place. Um, th these studies were written and published in the early 2000s. But since then, there's been no studies that have followed up. Well, an original contribution would be to update those studies to extend the analysis and the data collection um, and ask similar kinds of questions and see, you know, explore and, and, you know, analyze the evolution of that political party in the period after those last studies. So that's an original contribution because no one else has, has really updated that or written about that. Or in our journal, um, an original contribution might be that there's a particular um, unit within the US Immigration Service that deals with um, uh, terrorist suspects. Uh, and they roam around the airports and they, they grab people and then they interrogate them and so on. No one's really written about this before. In fact, hardly anyone knows that that exists. But, you know, an original contribution is for a scholar to say, hey, why has no one written about that? I'm going to write about this. Uh, and then they study them, they collect all the documents they can, they interview people uh, who have never, you know, spoken about it before, and then they write up an article that explains what this group does, maybe does a critique of one of the cases, uh, and then we can learn something about that particular group. So, so there are these kind of empirical contributions, but there are also um, methodological contributions you could make. So, there might be a particular topic, you know, terrorism that's been studied in a particular way, but no one's really studied it using this particular methodology. So to give you a broad example, um, when I first started studying terrorism, um, mostly it was being studied by political scientists, area studies specialists, um, historians, and so on. And they took a very kind of descriptive and factual kind of approach. Um, but one of the things that I did, and one of the things that made me the most, one of the most famous, you know, people in this area, is that I studied the language that you was used around terrorism. And my argument was, I think the language that we use, you know, 
structures the way we think and respond. So the way we describe something then, you know, makes us think of it in a particular way. So it's important to look at the language that's used about terrorism, the narratives that are told about terrorists, about who they are, what they do, why they do it, and how we can defeat them. Um, so I took a methodology uh, that hadn't been used to study terrorism before, and then I, I, I studied it. Uh, and then a whole series of other people did did similar things. And, you know, the study of, of the language of the war on terror and the, the language of terrorism and counterterrorism is now this huge, big um, sort of subfield. You know, so that's a methodological uh, contribution. There might be a theoretical contribution as well. And that's where someone might, for example, use particular uh, philosophers um, or particular uh, theorists who've come up with a particular uh, way of thinking, say, you know, securitization theory is something that we use in our field a lot. Uh, and this is the idea that particular issues get securitized through a very specific kind of pro pro process uh, as a way of responding to them. And then that securitization has all kinds of consequences for uh, the way society views it and the way society deals with it. And in some cases, it has very negative consequences. Now, you might um, think, well, there's an interesting question over here. I don't know, maybe um, cultural artifacts in, in, in um, Iraq. Um, and the question is, has anyone applied um, securitization theory um, or thought about how securitization theory might work together with, um, yeah, uh, museum studies or cultural studies. I, I don't know what the right what the right theory is that that's used in in that field. But combine those two to try and see if we might be able to shed light on this particular topic. So then, this is a kind of a theoretical contribution where you're. Um, taking theories from different fields or different philosophers and try to combine them in novel ways that no one has really done before. So the question here, the, the point here is always that it's really important to try and find that puzzle, that perspective, that, um, that gap in the current research that no one's really written about that you are going to try and, and fill and, and make an original contribution to. Um, it doesn't have to be a huge world-changing um, uh, gap that you've discovered or, or contribution that you make, but it has to it, it kind of has to add on to some existing things, but take it in a new direction. Um, it's not enough simply to summarize and just talk about what other people have already written. You need to you need to try and and find something new to write about and to research and to formulate in a new kind of way. Uh, 